Right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our regular Thursday Trending Treasury webcast. I'm David Green from Ireland Close, and I'm joined today by my colleague Mark Swallow. Uh, morning. And we're going to talk about interest rate swaps. Uh, been in the news a bit this week, hasn't it, Mark? It has, yes, yeah. Those of you that um, follow the well, national and local authority press would have seen that uh, it was announced last week that Penrith City Council were the first local authority to transact an interest rate swap for over 30 years and it's received a bit of um, you know, positive press mainly but we've had a few people making comments about um, legality etc and risks but we'll cover those sort of things in a bit more detail as we go through the, the session this morning but yes it has raised a lot of interest and I can see why the people that are coming into the session this morning that it's obviously something people want to hear a bit more about. Yeah, that's good. So what is an interest rate swap and, and why would you want to use one? OK, Dave, that's a good question to start the um, session off with and the slide, the next slide should put it into a bit of context. So local authorities at the moment are predominantly funding their borrowing from short term, short term sources. So this graph demonstrates the local authority are paying a floating rate note, floating rate of interest rate, and that's linked to Sonia, which is the sterling overnight rate, plus a margin, which is applied by those local authorities looking to lend to their peers. And that rate is variable and will fluctuate and will either rise or fall depending on interest rate movements. And there's a risk there because obviously at the moment everyone's funding their capital programmes at very, very low rates, but over time those rates will increase. And what do you do if you want to try and lock out that interest rate risk? Well, the sort of time honored way is to enter into an interest rate swap. So on the right hand side of this transaction, the local authority enters into a transaction where they determine a fixed rate and they pay that fixed rate to the to the bank. And every three months, the, the bank pay the local authority the Sonia rate. So I think on the next slide, it's into a bit more context in terms of how how the hedging applies. So you'll see there on the graph on the top, the two Sonia elements of the, the trade are matched and they're hedged out. So the economic impact of the transaction is the council will pay the margin above Sonia on the borrowing it undertakes short term, plus the fixed rate it pays to the bank. So the Sonia paid and the Sonia received should match each other off perfectly um, and a hedge, hedge is achieved. And we're trying to show here in the box below the impact in terms of interest rate um, movements, because obviously interest rates rise and fall over time. And the interest rate swap that Plymouth entered into was a, a 20 year transaction. So over that 20 years, interest rates will move around the fixed rate that was agreed. So we're showing here quarter one, Sonia, the short term rate, the market convention rate was at 0.05%. And we're assuming that in the local authority market, market, a 15 basis point margin was applied. So in, a, in theory, the local authority would, would be paying roughly 20 basis points to fund its short term borrowing requirement over that first quarter. It would pay a fixed rate, it would agree a fixed rate in the swap transaction with the bank at 0.55. And it would receive the Sonia, so it would receive the 0.05 back from the bank. So the impact on the local authority is the margin it's paying in the market plus the fixed element of the swap. And so the total cost of its debt is 0.7. So those of you who are listening in will think, well, that's expensive relative to the short rate. You know, the short term rate is 0.5 plus the margin, 0.2, but we're paying 0.7. Well, we're not always worried about the now, are we? The, the swap is a, a long term contract and it's managing risk over a long, a long period of time. So over time, interest rates will rise and we're trying to sort of reduce the impact of that increase in interest rates over time. I think one of the things that's been raised in the in the criticisms of the swap that's been undertaken recently is the impact of or the potential of in negative rates. So again in this illustration we're showing that you know quarter two rates go negative and we're, 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 we're nearly there aren't we you know some local authorities are borrowing from each other at zero. You might get to a point where bank rate goes negative and in, into local authority rates go negative. So in this example quarter two Sonia is minus Point, point one, the margin that's supplied by local authorities in the market is 0.1. So the rate that the local authorities are paying to borrow is zero. We're still paying 0.55 in the fixed rate of the of the 
x leg swap but we're receiving 0.1 from the bank receiving the negative interest rate so the net impact of that is sorry we're paying um, 0.1 to the bank because it's a negative interest rate and the net impact of that is 0.65 and then interest rates will rise so in the quarters three and quarters four we've got an increase interest rate increase of interest rates of 0.25 five the margins applied and Sonia has received and so the impact effectively over this four quarters of this swap transaction the, the local authority is paying the fixed rate and any margin that's applied and we're assuming that there's always a margin applied to into local authority lending and and there has been cases where the margin has been around 20 basis points but there are also times when the margin is is not not applicable so effectively depending on what the margin is that will influence the total cost but the fixed rate is where we're we're interested in we're fixing interest costs at 0.55 over the life of the swap transaction hopefully that answers your question david yeah i think it's fair to say that there's a little bit of variation in the margin but it's the variation of sonia which is what drives the interest rate mm. isn't it absolutely absolutely yeah and, um, and a long-term trade isn't it so we're, we're talking at the moment of mega mega low rates but over the next 20 years rates will be a lot higher than they were what they are now i would assume and the impact on the council on taking the swap will be a fixed rate of around the fixed leg of the swap yeah i mean i know as treasury management advisors we like to forecast interest rates i guess the honest truth is we don't know for certain what's going to happen and 20 years is an awful long time to uh, guess isn't it it is yeah yeah yeah. And and that's why the swap has been transacted, and it's only been transacted on a, a proportion of, of the overall short-term debt portfolio of that, of that local authority. So that local authority is taking a view that it wants to lock out an, an element of, of, of the risk that it's, that it's holding, but it's willing to continue to fund variable at very short rates on the on the rest of its portfolio. Yeah. So I guess the, instead of doing a swap, they could have done what most local authorities would have done in the past, which is to go to PWB and take a loan, but that would yeah. be more expensive, wouldn't it? That's right, yeah, indeed, yeah. I think the next slide sort of outlines that and puts that into context, so we move on to the next slide. So, you know, there are there are various ways to, to fund to fund the um, the debt portfolio, and, and this, this table shows the impact on a, a notional 25 years for a 20-year period. So, yeah, the local authority could do what it's doing now, borrow short term. What it's doing there is it's paying the market rate, which we've assumed at 0.35, and it's also paying that margin that we discussed earlier. So the total cost of the short term debt is, a, is half a percent. So over a 20 year period, that's 2.5 million total cost. But there are risks, risks around that. There's the risk that the rate increases. So there's market risk and there's risk that the margin increases. So there's all there's those risks that are always there, even though rates are really, really low. You know, there are some risks um, associated with that type of borrowing and Obviously, short term borrowing from other local authorities is free to repay. You just don't renew your, your loan. If you want to you realise you've over borrowed, then at the next reset day, you just pay your money back. So it's very, very cheap, but it's there are risks there. As we mentioned, you've got the PWB. Well, the PWB variable rate loans are available. And we're showing here that the PWB variable rate is roughly 2.2%. It's expensive, isn't it? It's a lot more expensive relative to the to the short term option. But there's there's only market risk associated with that transaction. And also P will be um, loans, variable rate loans can be repaid for three at the interest reset dates. So that's an option that could be looked at. And also there's the fixed term, the P will be fixed rate. That rate is a lot higher. I mean, that's the highest of those, of those four rates we're showing on this table. And therefore, the total cost is higher. But it locks out all the risk. You know, you've set a rate that's it's set in stone. It's not going to deviate at all. There's no margin risk. There's no market risk. But as we all know, at the moment, P W B rates um, are high, and the repayment rates are high, and the cost of repaying is high. So you can lock out risk in, in that in that way, but it's very very expensive to do so. Whereas the the swap, you know, we're showing again the market rate of 0.35. We've increased the margin to say 0.35 to show a higher cost potentially. So it's, it is slightly higher than the um, short term only, but it's taken out that market risk. And as we're showing hopefully in a few slides time, the actual repayment, early repayment of those 
of the swaps is a lot lower than the PWRB. So we believe that using a swap to fix your interest rate risk or take that off the table is a better option than the current um, only other game in town, which is the Public Works Loan Board. And we're just showing again on the table below, you know, what the PWRB rates are for various tenors, you know, 10 years after 50, versus what we believe swap rates would be um, in a short term plus the swap. And that's a big saving when you're looking on fairly large debt portfolios. You're saving between 1.6 and 1.9 percent. And in the um, in the Plymouth example, I think the savings are around 2.1 percent on the um, underlying PWLB. But so that's a big saving over 20 years on a on a fairly large number. So it's something that we we're strongly supportive of. Yeah, there's a quite big savings there, aren't there? Mm. On that 25 million pound loan. But I think the key the key message is, isn't it, that we're not we're not we're not advocating swaps just to save money. We are, you know, we are first and foremost, it's an interest rate risk management tool, which is a lot cheaper than the alternatives, i.e. fixing out, but also demonstrates a big saving. So it, it gives you it takes risk off the table, it generates savings as well. So it's got two two big advantages. Yeah. I mean I think I might summarise that top table. And so the short term borrowing is the cheapest, but it's got the most risk to it. Oh. PW variables are a lot more expensive uh, and you lock out the margin, but quite at a high number, 1.8, but you're still yeah. exposed to all that market risk of rates. So that's basically expensive and risky, Yeah. which is why people tend not to do PW variable. PW fixed, more expensive, but lowest risk. But then the short term and swap, you sort of got the cheapness of the short term borrowing. Indeed. But most of the risk reduction of the PDL would be fixed. So sort of best of both worlds. That's right. Slightly more expensive and a little bit of the risk retained. But sort of risk reward seems to be the best balance. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we're taking interest rate swap to reduce our interest rate risk. Um, but there's potentially some other risks that will take on when you do this, aren't there? And I guess legal risk and hands with the Fulham is the, yeah. the story here, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, and the next slide just sort of outlines the risks that you know need to be considered. We're not just saying this is the you know you know a free lunch, go into a swap, and and all your um, problems are solved because there are other risks you need to consider when entering into the transaction, as you would have probably seen. Those of you that, that follow our, um, those of you that sit the members and follow the comments of our chief executive, Mr. Whiteman, he's come out and believes that the um, swap transaction is illegal. Well, you know there is a there is a risk that it could be deemed illegal. Hammersmith and Fulham, the case there was was that le local authorities had no power to inter enter into interest rate swaps, but the local authorities that we're working with that are going for, that have either transacted or going through the point of getting to transaction have undertaken. A lot of due diligence in terms of getting QC's opinions to confirm that the power is available. The bank that have transacted have also um, got legal opinions that confirm that view. So you know there are two legal opinions out there on the on the client and the bank side that confirm it's legal. And um, but there is a there is a risk that somebody challenges challenges the transaction at some point in the, in the future. Those of you that have followed Hammersmith and Fulham and read your history books will will remember it was the district auditor that challenged that that transaction or it wasn't just one transaction you did you did mention the other day david how many how many swaps were being tran were there that were in existence um i think at the type they had 300 million of borrowing but yeah. six billion pounds worth of swaps yeah and they were swapping fixed rate borrowing into variable yeah yeah so yeah. it's a totally different different yeah. set of circumstances but again it's something that you need to consider um credit risk you know that the 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 bank that you're transacting with there will be times when they you have to post collateral with the bank so you need to be sure that the bank are able to um you know pay that collateral back and therefore you want to ensure that the bank that you're transacting with meet your credit worthiness criteria um liquidity risk you know at the moment the swap has been transacted the fixed rate is being paid and the local authority are funding short term from other local authorities. Um, you know, there, there is a, a large amount of money available in the local authority market at the moment. I think the latest stats suggested there's 50 billion pounds of, of investments out there in the local authority market. 
but will that always be available? And what would happen if, if, if it got to a point in say 10, 15 years time, you know, the local authority market was pretty much dry of cash and, and, and the swap was in place. Um, you would have what's known as an orphan swap and you wouldn't be able to fund it in the short term market. So there's a risk you need to consider that you're always going to be able to fund the short term element. And we've also we've already discussed the margin and the basis risk, haven't we, in, in the previous slides. So if this, this transaction isn't without risks. And therefore, if you're going to if you're interested in, in, in moving this forward and, and potentially want to talk about swaps in more detail, you know, you need to be aware that there are some things that you need to satisfy yourself of before you enter the transaction. And that's why we don't see this as a, a commoditized transaction. We just don't see it as something that anybody can pick up and go with. We, we realize that there's a lot of work to be undertaken to make sure you're comfortable with everything that's, you know, there on that slide effectively. Yeah, I think I think none of those are insurmountable, but they're all to be borne in mind, aren't they? Mm. Um, That's right. The legal, legal side, the general power of competence and the uh, you know QC's opinions on both sides sort of covering that. I think given there were a lot of banks who got heavily burnt through the hands of the Fulham exercise, you know, a bank transacting this will have taken it special care that the swap yeah. will stand. Yeah. I think that's what I think that's why this, it's taken 30 years to get a transaction over the line. I think what it's taken nine years since the, the general power has been enacted because yeah. it's not been that local authorities haven't wanted to do a swap. It's the fact that banks haven't felt comfortable that, you know, as you said, David, the bank that's transacted recently has undertaken a lot of work around getting a legal opinion that it, that it can use. You know, local authorities got the power to do it so they wouldn't be entering into the transaction. Because of in the in the Hammersmith of the Fulham case, it was the banks that were offside and that lost money, wasn't it? So it wasn't the local authorities that lost money; it was the banks. And yeah, so as you point out, a lot of work's gone into this to get it to this far, but that's why it's taken so long to get to this point. Yeah, so I think legal's pre pretty well covered. You know, yeah. subject, subject to in the end, a court case is the only way to prove that. That's right. I doubt it will get there. Liquidity, you know, I guess. Local authority short term market can dry up, but there's other options for borrowing short term or variable loans, aren't there? We've got uh, banks offering variable rate loan facilities. And of course, I guess your backstops, the PWB variable. That's right, yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. And I think that plays into the margin risk or what some people call basis risk as well. So remember, uh, in March this year, it was an unusual situation. The, coronavirus pandemic and the dash for cash we saw some local authority transaction rates go up to two percent so that was like sort of base rate plus one and a quarter but i guess if that happens for a long time your backstop is to borrow from pwb mm. so, you know both for liquidity reasons or for margin reasons so i think they're all risks that are possible but there's they've all been considered in the relatively low. I think we've got another slide on credit risk and how how that would work. Yeah, I think the next slide covers that. Yeah, because um, yeah, if you're, uh, if interest rates rise, you're going to be expecting money from the bank, aren't you, in the future? So you've got a credit risk exposure to the bank that way. Yeah. It's, you, you don't have 25 million pounds worth of exposure. No. Because although it's 25 million pound swap, you're not actually lending them that cash. But there's still a risk exposure, so the collateral uh, hedges that off. How, how does that work? Well, as, as the um, the table shows, you know there are you can repay a swap early, and every quarter the swap is valued. The um, the mark to market valuation of the cost of terminating the swap is valued, and that effectively is the amount of collateral that's posted either by the the swap counterparty or the local authority and in the in the table here we're showing that if rates fell by one percent so let's say the swap was transacted and rates fell by one percent then the council would be required if it wanted to terminate the swap early would be required to pay 3.1 million pounds to um, transact that to um, collapse that swap and that's the effectively the value of the swap um, it's got 10 years to run in this example the swap was the, is the 25 million pound 20 year swap that we that we've been using in the examples prior so the council would need to post 3.1 million pounds of collateral to the bank 
if rates rose, then it would be the other side. So if, if interest rates increased by 1%, then the bank would post collateral to the local authority. And that's and so therefore, whoever's in the money or at the money is posting collateral. So the other side is not going to be um, you know, out of pocket if, the, if either organisation defaulted, for instance, um, there will be money available to effectively compensate the other side for having to break the swap. So that, that is a, you know, something that doesn't exist in, in, in other transactions. So as a local authority, you are protected, but that's why you want to ensure that the bank that you're transacting with is, is, is credit worthy from the outset and something you continue to monitor. And in the, all, all of the, um, the um, legal paperwork that goes along with, with these transactions, there are certain events which can terminate swap and therefore you know, if a bank became less credit worthy than it currently is, then you could terminate the swap early but you would have the money available to you it would be posted to you as, as collateral to protect you against the cost of unwinding that of winding that swap you'll see there in, in the in the table you know if rates fall the numbers that have to be posted by the by the local authority get quite large if the rate if rates fell by two percent you know the local authority in this case would be, have to post six million pounds worth of collateral with the bank but again you know, in the, in the uh, negotiations and the paperwork, we c you can put in thresholds. So therefore, if swap rates fall, you only post collateral if a threshold is breached. And it could be in this example, the threshold is say seven million pounds. And even though the collateral required to be posted by the local authority is six million pounds, it wouldn't have to post the collateral because that's written into the documentation. That's part of the negotiation process. And it's part of the pricing process um, and therefore, you know, it's something that, again, the work that we help clients undertake is to get the right thresholds in place and try and estimate what the what the collateral posting will be in various interest rate environments. What's interesting is those breakage costs relative to the Public Works Loan Board. So you see there that whatever, whatever happens to the rates in this example, you know, to get out of the Public Works Loan Board will always cost you money, whereas in a rising rate environment, breaking a swap, actually you get paid you know, you'll get paid money to break that swap early. So again, it's added flexibility. It's another advantage, another tick in the box of swaps. Yeah, I think that's the key thing about the Public Works Loan Board, isn't it? The uh, difference between the new loan and the repayment rates are uh, over 1% difference. Yeah. Whereas with a the swap, they're very much closer together. Yeah. So that's why you get much smaller breakage costs. Uh, yeah, I think that's important. So we've been keen to protect the local authority against the risk of the bank going bust. So the bank always has to post collateral. So these green numbers there, as rates rise, the bank will actually give that money to the local authority. So if the bank goes bust, it's already paid for the SOP to be broken. Yeah, it's already paid you the discount. But because the local authorities are much more credit worthy than banks, the bank isn't so worried about receiving collateral on the other side. When banks swap with companies, they are, but mm. the bank swapping with the local authority, clearly the risk of local authority going bust is uh, pretty minimal. So they're not interested in having small amounts of collateral back from you. And it's only no. if it's, yeah, a large sum. And I think the chance of rates falling by 2% from here must be getting pretty remote, I think. I guess never say never. No. You know, what the 1%, the 1% rate fall from the you know the swap that's been transacted could occur but if there's a threshold in place which would pretty much mean that the um the the, the tax wouldn't need to be posted so again and, and again that's not a key feature of the um the transaction that's been undertaken yeah that's important isn't it yeah uh so we've got a list of some of the th steps you need to take before you would enter into a swap transaction yeah and that goes back to that risk matrix isn't it you know Making sure that you cover off all those un unexpected you know, those risks we have you haven't really considered. The SIP for Treasury Management Code. That's clear about what you need to what you need to do. You need to ensure there's a legal power to transact. Well, we're we're confident that there is um, approval of the derivatives, use of derivatives in your strategy. Uh, I think most of the local authorities that follow our our advice and use our Treasury Management Strategy probably have already got that that approval already written into their strategy. Um, be clear on what financial instruments can be used and what circumstances they are used. There will be probably be a, a few banks out there now that have seen this 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 swap and will be looking to to con, you know transact other types of derivatives. Now that they've seen derivatives um, 
in the market. Not all derivatives are, um, you know, acceptable. So you need to be sure that you are understand the instrument and why you're entering into that instrument. It's clear we we feel that you only use derivatives for risk management purposes. You don't use them for speculation. And that's going back again to that Hamilton and Fulham case where it's clear that they were, as David pointed out, they were they were trying to make money out of swaps rather than use them to to to, um, to manage risk. Yeah. Make sure that you take proper advice and consider that advice, and fully understand all the risks that are involved. And and again, you know, you go into this with your eyes wide open and you consider every single risk that's out there before you transact. And you make sure that you 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 know you 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 understand those risks and. Have, resolve those risks really and the bank on the other side you know they they make sure that you have received expert legal and financial advice they won't transact with you unless you can demonstrate that you've done everything that SIFA require you to do um, so they you know they want to make sure that you can use the derivatives um, in, your, in your strategy most banks will want you to have a specific committee resolution for the transaction they want you to take this to your full council probably or cabinet and, and actually get it approved that you are entering the, the transaction and, and, and you've laid out all of the risks and rewards of that and you need to confirm that you are again making that transaction for risk management not speculation you've you considered all the risks and rewards um, you've undertaken proper due diligence and, and it's gone through your scheme of delegation you're not borrowing advance of need um, and you're not acting for a commercial purpose. So they're, they're key requirements from the bank. The bank want to make sure that you are you are using this transaction to hedge risk on, on the existing debt portfolio effectively or an existing short term portfolio, but also a future borrowing requirement if you've got one of those. So it's quite clear that you there's lots of boxes to be ticked before you can even get to the stage of discussing the, the pricing of the swap. Yeah, so it is involved. It's, it's something that will take you several weeks maybe a month or so to to arrange isn't it yeah but it's it must be worth putting that time and effort in if, if it can save you against today's PWB rates you know up to 1.9 percent we're fairly hopeful PWB is going to cut its rates but it'd still save you up to one percent against new PWB rates couldn't it so it's that's right yeah. saving. And, and, and takes risk takes a risk off the table as well so it's you know it's key it's a yeah it's a, and it's, a, and it's a tool that's you know being is used but in the corporate sector it's used in the, the sort of other sort of not-for-profit sectors housing associates use them universities use them you know so they're not uncommon it's not something new it's not we're not trying to bring in something that's never been used before it's a you know, it's a massive market in the swap market and um we think local authorities should be able to use them and and, and they are because we, we're talking about a, a local authority that's actually transacted Super, thanks, Mark. Do you want to cover uh, the accounting side of things, David, or briefly, or because that's not as straightforward as. Yeah, we've got a few questions actually, which one of them covers that. Uh, um, there's one about the collateral. Uh, where is collateral held, and is there a charge for a collateral management service? It's uh, held in your bank. So if the bank posts collateral, they post it to you, your bank account. And if you post at the bank, you post it with them, and there's no and. You receive interest on the collateral that is posted for you, with you, and you and, and and the bank receive. So that's how you, there's no charge for that. So collateral is, is held in your your nominated bank account. And this is because we're using cash collateral. I think yeah. a lot of the time the market's based around using gilts or bonds as collateral, yeah. but we we yeah. agreed to have cash, which is that's much right. simpler, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Cool. Okay. Uh, another question on uh, how would you hold the interest rate swap in your accounts? That doesn't need to be revalued every year. Well, that's, uh, that's one for you, Dave, on hedge accounting. I would probably suggest. <laughs> I'll take that. So yeah, so you'd have the swap shown at its fair value, which would be similar to its break cost in your accounts. Uh, now the standard accounting was like fair value to profit and loss, and that would mean that you would take changes in that fair value through to revenue. But because you're using the swap for hedge hedging purposes, so you're hedging your interest rate risk, you're allowed to uh, defer those fair value movements into a hedge reserve. Um, and therefore you ensure that the financial impact in your accounts is the same as the economic impact of the swap. So that when rates go up, your 
interest cost is fixed. And when rates go down, your interest cost is fixed. So there's a couple of steps to do. You need to designate that the swap is hedging the, that certain risk on those certain loans. And you need to show every year that it is uh, still doing that. But find that's the case, then you don't take any fair value gains and losses to revenue. You take them to a separate reserve. That's sort of standard hedge accounting is used by companies and registered providers all over the country. And the code of practice includes a section on hedge accounting, isn't it? I understand. Indeed. Uh, so I've got a question. Why is Rob Whiteman so convinced that it's illegal? You have to ask Rob Whiteman that, I guess. I know. I mean, he's obviously read the uh, 30 year old um, court judgment, but you yeah. know, the law's moved on in that time, hasn't it? That's right, indeed. Yeah, yeah so uh, general power of competence I think is quite quite wide ranging and gives a lot of powers to local authorities. Lo legal powers must be used uh, reasonably. You know, it's not yeah. an open wide way to do it, but it's. But I think that's the thing about getting legal advice first, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Not, not relying on the law 30 years ago, but getting a qualified opinion on what the law is today. Uh, yeah, good one. Um, so the bank will potentially be asking for margin from you or you have to post or you'll be receiving margin collateral from the banks. Uh, calculations of that, that's something we would help with. You know, uh, whether we give you a spreadsheet to work it out yourself or we'll do that for you potentially. Uh, and something we'd assist with the hedge accounting as well. Yeah, I think I think banks are going to be unlikely to want to transact with authorities without them receiving financial advice on it and if you employ us to give you the financial advice we'll help you all those accounting issues as well so with that uh, running out of times anything else we need to chat about mark um i don't think so i think we just want to um alert listeners to our next week's webcast so um we've got a slide on that coming up yeah so you know we carry on these web these webcasts every week next week uh, my colleague david blake is talking to carl harder at abundance about community bonds so um you know we hope you're finding these these webcasts interesting and um we'll be listening in ourselves next week and we'll hopefully see you guys there as well so thanks a lot for listening in today yeah thanks everyone um if you've got any more questions send them through to us and we'll, we'll answer any questions after the event uh and the webcast will be available on our YouTube channel and on our website shortly. Thanks everyone, goodbye for now. Bye.